everybody. I'm Marta Golovka, Development Director at the Energy Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar, which we're holding in partnership with IBM. For those of you who might not know, the Energy Institute is an independent network of professionals spanning the whole energy system. We bring together expertise so that energy can be better understood, managed, and valued. And so working with our members, we help the industry to tackle urgent challenges. And certainly the topic of today's webinar is very pertinent in the light of the impact that COVID-19 is having on remote operations. And our expert speakers will provide a lot of good food for thought for you to take away. Now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome all our panelists. And in particular, I have pleasure in introducing our chair, Fellow of the Energy Institute, Ron Mobbett. Ron has had a very accomplished career, including several years at Lumberger, IHS, and more recently as CEO of Elsevier. And currently, he is a non-executive director at Aviva. Ron, over to you. Thank you very much, Marta. And let me add my welcome to all of you who are participating. Uh, we're very pleased indeed to see participants from a wide cross-section of the energy sector, from companies, government, and from academia around the world. The Energy Institute is fast becoming a primary convening point for constructive discussions about the energy sector in general and the energy transition in particular. Being able to bring topics of importance to the attention of members and non-members across the globe is one of its goals, and this webinar is part of that. I'd encourage you to contribute to this discussion and actually also to involve yourself with the work of the Energy Institute in general. The topic today is digital transformation, technology for efficient automated remote operations. A lot is being said nowadays about digital transformation, not just in energy, but in other sectors, uh, in commerce, in government, and in the world of social interaction. But what does it mean in practice? What does digital transformation in general mean in, in practice? What are the benefits? Who does it impact? How do you implement a digital transformation? The part of our digital transformation for today's discussion is automated remote operations. In particular, the opportunities for efficiencies, cost savings, and enhanced safety across the entire energy system. Clearly, work has been going on on this for quite some years, but the impacts of the recent energy price moves, the demands for net zero, and now COVID-19 make the subject highly topical. Today, we have three expert speakers from Chevron, IBM, and ABB, who each have a broad, a broad perspective, but also have specific expertise to bring to bear on our subject. Let me then introduce our first speaker, the format being a series of prepared remarks from each, and then we'll move into a panel discussion. During the panel discussion, I will ask questions that are pre-prepared, but I would also like to make sure that we have the maximum number of questions coming from, as you heard from Marta, through the chat. Daniel Hunt, Energy Institute, he is an upstart in the Digital and Acceleration Group at Chevron. That team is responsible for creating and driving forward the enterprise digital strategy for Chevron. Daniel's career has led him to assignments in each of Chevron's four upstream operating companies, providing him with a wide range of experiences throughout Chevron's global business. He studied at Heriot Watt University in Edinburgh in Scotland, and prior to that, he served as an officer in the British Army and as a humanitarian aid worker during the conflict in Bosnia-Herzegovina. He is a former member of the Energy Institute Professional Affairs Committee. Let me hand over now to Daniel. Well, thank you, Ron, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this panel. 
As we um, consider the future of work, this is an area that I, I'm certainly passionate about, but more importantly, and more importantly for the people on, on the uh, listening to the webinar, this is a key enabler for our business strategies and to remain competitive in any environment. Well, it's great to meet you all virtually, and I thought I would start with explaining a little bit more about what I do. As Ron was saying, I'm in a small team that was put together by our chairman to create and drive an enterprise digital strategy. At the heart of it was to accelerate our progress in moving digital from the edge of the business to ingrained in the way we do things. This strategy encompasses people, process, and technology in equal measures with our goal to maximize the value of every piece of data, rapidly taking data to information, information to insights, and most importantly, insights to decisions that create value. So this is a journey that we've been on with our 43 businesses and functions across 120 countries for two years now, and we have made excellent progress. We are not doing digital for the sake of digital. There is a relentless focus on value and aligning our portfolios to support our business goals. These businesses told us that some of their most important opportunities lay under the themes of connected worker, intelligent operations, and situational awareness. And for Chevron, that's how we see remote operations. The connected worker is about enabling field workers to reduce their dependency on the office, enhance productivity, and protect their safety and well-being. It allows instant access to remote experts and critical information through technologies such as last mile connectivity, HoloLens, wearables, and handhelds. Intelligent operations are about transforming the capability to monitor, maintain, predict, and optimize equipment and production systems through automation and advanced analytics of real-time data. It's also designed to remove workers from high-risk environments through the application of automation on autonomous technologies like drones and robots. And situational awareness is one that I'm particularly interested in as it covers how people, vehicles, materials, and equipment are interacting with one another in the environment. It's about delivering the right information to the right people at the right time, providing insights and analytics through time and space of the current operation, the critical issues, and future predictions. It enables decisions that enhance productivity and the safety of our people and assets. These three concepts intersect with multidisciplinary teams in what we call an Integrated Operations Decision Center, or IODC. And I'm excited to explore all of these capabilities uh, during this panel. The challenges facing our industry are of a scale that is unprecedented. Whilst our operations remain largely unaffected by the direct effects of COVID-19, the secondary effects have been large. The economic downturn and erosion in the demand of liquid hydrocarbons have potential for long lasting impact. The lower for longer oil price has organizations pondering how to survive and then thrive in this new normal. The entire energy industry is expected to cut $400 billion of investment this year, according to the International Energy Agency, and a large proportion of that will come from the oil and gas sector. This reduction will surely impact the pace of investment and it has the potential to slow our progress in remote operations and automation. In addition, the travel restrictions and demobilization of non-essential personnel is impacting execution timing of foundational investments, such as field-wide LTE and laser scanning of facilities. But whilst there's a lot to be concerned about, there's an opportunity to be excited too. As Chevron entered the second quarter of this year, three quarters of our workforce are effectively working remotely, with the rest working across our fields, platforms, and plants to keep energy flowing into the system. The use of collaboration tools, augmented reality, and remote inspections has dramatically increased. Whilst the journey had already begun, this has offered us the opportunity to accelerate our technical capabilities and test our, our systems 
at a scale we've been unable to do before. Likewise, the economic downturn and future outlook offers a pivot point. One of the great stories of our industry in the last downturn was that in 2016, when oil price had halved, we could make the same profit on a barrel of oil as we had done in 2014. It's worth pondering on that for a moment and thinking about how we can go again and make a step change in our margins. Our industry is full of amazing people and we will rise to the challenge as we always do. Here at Chevron, we believe that better, faster decision-making, increased productivity and minimizing our operational risks are all key enablers to maximize the margins from the products that we produce. We are doubling down on our digital efforts in our pursuit for ever cleaner and more affordable energy. Thank you, Ron. Great, Daniel, thank you very much for that. Um, quite an interesting uh, coverage of the landscape from the people process technology to the data to info insights and decisions and then some practical activities that uh, Chevron is taking now in front of the, as you call them, unprecedented challenges. Let me move now to our second speaker. Our second speaker is Hans Clausen. He is the digital lead from ABB. Hans has been working in the electronics industry for more than 30 years, and his experience ranges from electronics development, electronic production, network design, safety systems, and electronic electrical control systems. Within ABB, he has had roles within sales, R&D, and various management roles. He's currently the digital lead for the energy industries in Northern Europe. For those of you who don't know very much about ABB, ABB is a pioneering technology leader that works closely with utilities, industry, transportation, infrastructure customers around the world. Its leading digital products and solutions have been designed to meet real world, need, real world needs of the industry based on over 50 years of experience with a team of 5,000 experts and the implementation of over 3,000 projects worldwide. And with that, let me hand over to Hans Clausen. Thank you, Ron, and uh, thank you to the Institute for inviting me into this session, and also to all the registrants that uh, show interest in this subject. As stated, I'm uh, the digital lead uh, geographically for Northern Europe in what ABB labels as energy industries. And as Ron pointed out, we are a large provider of instruments, control, controllers, motors, drives, robots. Uh, I like to use the sentence uh, that we are into moving electrons on purpose. And I think that is very much what we're actually talking about here today. Uh, it's important to understand that ABB has their expertise within what we call operational technology, or OT for short. And there is an important difference between that and what we call information technology. Uh, and what I'll be speaking mostly about is operational technology. An obvious such difference is the way that we treat real-time data compared to how an IT system would, for instance, treat near real-time data. But before I go on, I should probably highlight here, if this was a regular presentation, I would have a slide about some legal uh, things from ABB. In order to avoid that, I'm saying to you now that what I'm state and saying is my opinion and might not reflect ABB's view. Uh, and from my perspective, <clears throat> As of today, there are very, very few limitations as to what technology can provide and what problems we actually can save. Very often when we are in discussions among ourselves within ABB and also with our clients, we find that implementing remote control is very much often limited to the actual processes that you have 
on how you operate your plant or how the resources are used to operating uh, the plant. And we don't see very much difference between a green field versus a brown field. Uh, the difficulties with a brown field might that it's difficult to adjust and implement new technology. Uh, a green field is very much the same because a lot of what a green field is, is a blueprint of a plant designed by an EPC some 10, 15 years ago. So now that everybody wants to go digital, uh, it creates issues. I think from ABB's perspective and my personal perspective, where we've had success is when we actually start small, but think big. And then we must be prepared to either fail fast or scale fast. So when you've identified something in a plant or a factory or a offshore platform or whatever, that you see there are values that can be taken out either through automation or digital in itself, <clears throat> you need to start with the smaller pieces. <clears throat> and creating a strategy for digital does not mean that you know where you will end up, but you take these small steps and you know that with each step you take, you're actually doing an improvement to your current value creation. And this should be easy also to do for, for brown fields. I, 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 I've seen several newspaper articles about big global companies that have stated they want to save billions in going digital. Uh, and then they go all in and try for this big bang. And I have yet, at least personally, to see any of these companies actually succeed with such an approach. And I think the green fields could follow the same path and example, uh, but I think their focus should be that you need to have a very, very strong focus on modern or flexible infrastructure and not concern yourself with too much of the applications or the value add. Let that be up to the operational philosophy of the plant to solve. Uh, but rather also have a huge focus on what is the operational philosophy. Because it's through that you can actually iron out faults that makes it difficult to start up a plant, faults that um, makes it impossible to start a plant. We've seen that. Uh, and where you have to have so many manual operations from the operator side, that it becomes a nightmare to maintain and keep running. <clears throat> and then to illustrate starting small, <clears throat> I would like to highlight that we should start at the sensor side. I think we should think about what we would like to monitor and why. When we know the why, uh, we could also probably identify the value we're trying to gain or find or identify. Uh, <clears throat> we see also in a lot of plants with today's networking levels that the resolution of the data that the, the sensors or instruments provide are not of the quality or resolution that we need in order to do meaningful data analytics. So in moving forward, we need to make sure that you have pathways through your network layers, or better yet, have a more flat network structure uh, <clears throat> than what you normally would have in an OT system today. And <clears throat> then when you do this, you hinder the network layers or the historians or wherever else you do filtering and limit of data resolution. 
uh, and and also another important aspect here is after you've paid your dollars for the control system and you have had, have it configured make sure that whatever mechanism you use to lift data out of the control system and the instruments maintain the contextualization you've already paid for and put into your control system there are plenty of standardizing body out there that can give you good guidance here. Um, here in Europe, we have Namur. Um, and Namur is actually global as well. Uh, in the US, you have this OPAF. Uh, and even though I do recommend to use standards, I think it's important to highlight that not all the, the work that the Standardization Institute is something that I agree on. To give you an example, I can say that I don't think uh, Namur is doing it right by saying that OPC UA, that is universal access, the new OPC standard, solves everything. Nor do I fully agree with OPAF uh, in the way that they try to fit any application into any controller. I think the automation engineer do have and bring a value add to the market that is very difficult to commoditize. Uh, and then when we have the data sources and the timing and everything taken care of and we get the contextualization, we can start thinking about how we stream data out of a plant or a factory. And whether you call that getting the data out to an on-prem solution somewhere, it might be on the plant itself, or whether you put it up in what we call the cloud or a hybrid version of the cloud. Uh, I think from my perspective, it is important to understand wherever you store your data that you're able and willing to share it. A lot of what it takes to be successful in digital is to break down the barriers. I mentioned operational uh, procedures before, uh, but also the barriers that exist be between us as a vendor and you as the client, for instance. We need to <clears throat> embrace the fact that it's partnerships that brings the best solutions to the marketplace. And not this, I buy this, or I install this, and you pay for this. And also when it comes to cloud, I'd like to mention that I think it's not important what type of cloud or cloud provider or services you use. What is important is that you keep an open mind and make sure that you can do inter-cloud communication so that you can keep all your channels open and are free to select application and services from the best, such as ABB. Uh, <clears throat> and I think with that, uh, I'll stop and hand it back to uh, Don. And thank you very much for that um, very detailed explanation of how um, to go about implementing one of these uh, uh, systems. Um, the idea of starting small, thinking big, failing or scaling fast, um, making sure you're adding value at, next, at each step, um, thinking about of information and thinking also about data sharing. Um, clearly, um, somebody bringing to bear some significant experience and expertise on the subject. Um, before I introduce our third and final speaker, let me um, remind you and encourage you to think about questions you may want to ask in a few minutes during our panel discussion. Um, there is a chat icon and the questions that you ask will come straight to me. Hans Bracke is our third speaker from IBM. Uh, Hans is um, the solution lead for service transformation at IBM. 
and um, he develops transformational industry propositions for greater efficiencies and growth and works with clients to reimagine their service models and drive the journey to customer-centric operations. In his work, he connects people, practices, and insights, phrases that you've heard already from our other two speakers, to maximize value from strategic platforms and embrace the power of the cognitive enterprise. And I'm sure Hans will expound on, uh, on how particularly IBM is doing that. Over to you, Hans. Uh, thank you, Ron. Thanks for the introduction. Um, and also uh, thanks to, uh, to Hans for kind of giving kind of an introduction to the operational technologies and Daniel talking about the kind of decision center and the connected worker. Um, so I'll try to bring all those pieces back together, but I thought to, to take that discussion from a different angle. Um, and we start from the kind of field service perspective and then really touching on how remote control, automation, all those pieces kind of feed back into that and really uh, the importance of indeed connecting all those pieces together. And so in, in my role, as, as well mentioned, I work with customers um, across the globe focusing on uh, indeed how they deliver services and, and what services they deliver. And quite often I speak with customers around, okay, what well, their main objectives are, definitely from a field service perspective, it's about efficiencies, it's about health and safety, it's about uh, reducing skill gaps and those kind of internal kind of uh, factors. And when we start working with them, we, we quite often open that out in terms of uh, uh, business objectives. And, and I'll give you a couple of examples of how the feeds are important, how it links back to both those uh, other technologies. So for example, um, a US organization focusing on in the exploration space uh, who will think about re-digitizing the field services um, and that key efficiencies were indeed around uh, and indeed the, the health and safety efficiency, et cetera. Um, and we started looking at the key imports now, which is really about data and data accuracy. So we, when we start putting the business case together, we start looking at the scope of the actual project itself, we started linking the importance of digitizing the field services, of course, but linking that with the remote information available, be it, be it through IoT and through other kind of systems and linking those data points together. When we implement that solution, uh, we quite quickly saw that uh, we, we achieved about 40% of data accuracy increase, and hopefully it'll go higher as we kind of start uh, rolling out the project further. The 40% increase significantly reduces the risks involved and also improves the decision-making of the program significantly. So that factor alone quite easily uh, outweighed all the other factors in, in, in the business case. So we already started looking at that the importance of linking that remote kind of monitoring control with your kind of your field service execution. And similarly, and if you're thinking about upstream and generation type businesses, they are very, very asset focused, right? So understanding your assets, your asset performance, that the, the, the impact it has on the on the, the production itself is going to be very key. So solutions like uh, uh, Hans Bjorn mentioned earlier, I mean those feed that information, those insights that you kind of visualize feed directly into your field service organization, right, to uh, optimize production, to minimize um, the kind of downtime, but, but also to start thinking about, okay, how can you execute that work that has least impact on the production, right? So, yes, it's about uh, remote, but it's also about the work that has to be done on site to make sure that happens at the right time with the least impact and happens uh, as, as quick as, uh, as, as, as possible. Um, and similarly, from your field service perspective, how do you feed your information back into those systems? Because not everything will be uh, left through IoT and Edge. Uh, so inspections, monitoring, control kind of functions, how can you kind of feed them back into those operations to really maximize the production line? So rather than just looking at field service efficiencies, it's more and more thinking about, okay, what's the final outcome from a production perspective? And if you think about the, the other end, the more the, the last mile side, yes, a lot about efficiencies, truck rolls, those kind of things. But increasingly, organizations are looking at using video control, the IoT type functions to monitor and control equipment and, and reduce the number of, of truck rolls required. Um, using AR for a kind of remote support towards even that, that customer facing uh, spectrum. Um, and on top of that is how can you then use those technologies and, and indeed those improved more personal type services to start thinking about um, customer satisfaction, upselling, cross-selling. So moving away from just looking at, uh, at cost reductions is also about indeed customer satisfaction. Uh, we did quite a big project with a, a company in, in Europe um, who saw kind of a 20% NPS improvement uh, over the three year period that we're kind of working with them at the moment. 
So significant impact, they link that to revenues and they're removing, I wouldn't say moving away from cost, cost electricity, but more and more thinking about, okay, what's the revenue, what's the value that field services and, uh, and the remote kind of uh, solutions provide. So when you think about it, it's all about linking those practices together, I was mentioning before, it's about linking the knowledge that companies have about asset as performance and the production and the information you can get from those systems with technology these days. And how do you link that with an execution piece? So with the management of the uh, of, of the, the, the people, right? And it's not just about supervisors and the employees, it's about how do you manage your, your partners? How do you manage your, your, your customers, your internal, external customers? How do you link those people with your risk and compliance functions with your uh, parts and, and kind of supply functions. So how do you link all those pieces together in a way that's still secure? So going back to the point that Hans made, how do you kind of make sure that the data you have and the insights you kind of start bubbling up from, from underneath the covers, how do you make that secure and get it in the hands of the right people at the right time? So we're not just thinking about linking the workflows, but it's the wider picture of end-to-end -end, uh, flows. And I kind of to finish off, I would like to focus on one more point. So it's not just about cost reduction and really starting adding more value and we start thinking about the business value you deliver. There's another big change happening, right? The landscape is changing and it also provides a big opportunity for remote control and for, for the kind of field service organizations. And that's all about um, the, the, the changes between the blurring of traditional uh, kind of uh, boundaries, right? Um, it's about all exact gas companies going into renewables. It's about organizations starting to create partnership and ecosystems. So energy companies are going into smarter homes, for example. Uh, well, when you, these days buy an electric car, you get in a car charger and a couple of years of free energy, all kind of packaged in one, 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 uh, one bundle. And what that means is that to achieve that kind of ecosystem, that kind of partnerships, you have to have a very deep understanding of your assets, of your performance, of your production of your services indeed and your kind of your field services, how they can be enabled through automation, through remote uh, monitoring and control. So all these pieces come kind of together um, in terms of, of the, uh, the changes and the opportunity that those changes bring with them. So when you think about the remote control and how that impacts your, your service delivery, yes, look at cost reduction, but also really think about how you can deliver value to the business and how you can show that value to your stakeholders internally and externally. That's great, uh, Hans. Thank you very much for that. Um, very interesting roundup of um, the opportunity from uh, remote to field services, insights that uh, field services can uh, can take action on in the field, but also, interestingly, how to feed back um, information insights derived from field services back into the centre. And uh, I think uh, a very good setup for the panel discussion around the blurring boundaries as you put them uh, as uh, oil and gas companies start thinking about entering renewables, utilities uh, go towards uh, smart homes and the whole transportation, personal transportation sector um, moving from vehicles to the whole energy system connected to the vehicle. That's it for the uh, prepared remarks from our three speakers. Um, we are about now to move into the panel discussion, but before we move into the panel discussion, um, I would like to invite the audience to participate in um, our polling. We have two questions to answer. Um, the Mentimeter poll should be opening now. And if you don't mind, go to the, uh, the Mentimeter site that you tried earlier. And uh, as you see on the screen, there are two questions. The first one, do you think COVID-19 will drive a significant change in automation and remote operations? And uh, we can see immediately um, the results from the audience becoming very, very clear. I think a very, very significant majority uh, answering yes to that question, not really surprisingly. We have a second question, which is about where you think automation can have the most impact. And here you have the option to enter three words, three keywords that would describe um, the areas that you think might be the most uh, uh, ripe for change. It could be, for example, um, offshore wind, it could be power distribution, it could be transportation, um, it could be upstream exploration. Um, whatever you think are going to be the places where the automation that you've been hearing about um, will have the most impact. And here you're seeing the earlier results. 
quite a strong focus on operations, operation maintenance, quite a strong one on safety, which is very interesting. Very good. So it looks like uh, operations, maintenance, safety. Um, interestingly, quite a lot of uh, interest on the upstream and transportation side, which largely measures some of the studies in particular that uh, Cap Gemini did recently on this. Very good. So um, there might be still some question uh, responses coming in, but I think um, we can perhaps move into the uh, the panel discussion and building on um, the answers to these questions. Um, Daniel, you've seen what the uh, what the participants think, but um, uh, would you give us your perspective on which stages of the energy system um, have the most potential impacts for this remote uh, automation? Um, opportunity. You know, when you're thinking about exploration, for example, power generation, power distribution, uh, consumption, um, how how would you see this? Um, and um, let me start with you, Daniel, but after that, please, uh, uh, our other two uh, panelists, please uh, chip in. Yeah, I think, Ron, this is a great question. We we certainly, I mentioned we started this journey a couple of years back, and, and when we came into role, we'd had some large um, consultancy companies kind of look across our value chain and identify areas where, where we have big value. But the, the answer is much more complex than that. I think wherever you have people process, um, there are opportunities to reimagine the way you work with digital technologies. And in the end, it all comes down to the value that you can obtain within that for that specific investment. So really integration of the value chain, um, having multidisciplinary teams, and really identifying the bottlenecks based on common goals is critical to its success. And you know, maybe to give an example of that, you don't want to streamline your supply chain services for drilling and completions in the Permian if your bottleneck is tying the wells into the facility. So you have to be very clear um, where those opportunities exist. And then the second piece is sometimes it can be difficult, particularly with these transformational ways of working, of identifying what this value proposition is. And so, you know, for me, one of the most fascinating stories I find is around uh, Rio Tinto's journey to uh, fully autonomous mines. And they knew that when they went into this, it was primarily around a kind of safety improvement to be gained. Um, and they did expect elements of productivity improvement. And so whilst all those things played out, I think the unexpected thing was they really improved the consistency of their product stream. And as a result, their iron ore became the market ore and it gave them a premium on the product. So as they went into this uh, automated um, mining concept, I don't think they quite realized that actually they were going to increase the value of their revenue stream as, as a result of automation. So I think from the from perspective of Chevron, we're really focused on integrating and optimizing that value chain and increasing the visibility and collaboration in the decision space so that we can maximize the margin of our products. You know, you don't want to go wholeheartedly after keeping your plants running at 100% tech, tech max for 100% of the time if the cost of doing that is eroding value from an operating expense point of view. And so I think um, it, it's quite a hard, um, a, a hard one to answer, and I think it really requires you to have a clear understanding of the value chain and how to optimize the whole system, not the individual components of it. Yeah, and I very much agree with you, uh, you there. So I think, uh, as I tried to indicate with some of the examples I gave earlier, uh, it's really understanding your business, right? We, we have a part you're in, if it's in the, the upstream, downstream, if it's in the distribution, or even the, the, the supplier side. Um, but it, it, it's taking also a little bit out of the box, right? So as, as you mentioned, we attend to the kind of unexpected kind of benefits afterwards. Um, I think there's, there's a lot happening with, um, as I mentioned, looking at different industries just outside your boundaries, see how you can kind of link those together, because a lot of the automation and the remote kind of uh, capability technologies that are out there really enable you to quite quickly link pieces together where you can get some, some quite big benefits, right? So it's not just about operational, it's also thinking outside that box and think about the, the partnerships, the ecosystems that really can drive enormous value. Um, but it's indeed finding, finding opportunities and thinking slightly wider than just the, the, the current business usual. 
Yeah, and I can only second both of you because uh, I think the, in identifying the value, you've made the biggest step you can do in order to move on to autonomous operations. Uh, and and as you mentioned in the mining, we have other examples from from onshore and offshore wind. We see it in in hydropower, uh, <clears throat> where they've automated and made the process autonomous but they still need the knowledge and the resources or the people if you like and, and the in-depth understanding of their value chain so that they can do these identification absolutely back to you ron yep so clearly the, the, just listening to to each of you there's a thread there about understanding your business deeply uh in order to to be to be able to understand how value might be created which in a way, it leads to a previous comment uh, earlier on about the importance of partnership. That the the, um, the providers um, may bring expertise in how to build and operate systems, but the uh, owner operators uh, themselves may have the expertise on the ground, and that combination could be quite powerful. Um, let me let me move on to a different question. Um, it's related to the. Um, to the survey question around COVID-19. Um, and we got a very, very strong vote from the audience that uh, that COVID-19 would have a big impact on the way in which organizations think about remote operations. Could you, um, and starting um, with you, Hans Bracker, could you talk about how you see this? What, uh, what signals are you getting from IBM, from your customers? Um, about this subject? Are people latching on to automation? Are they worried, as I think you heard uh, Daniel saying about uh, whether there's the ability to invest? How are you seeing it? And then I, I, will, I would like to give equal time to all three. Um, but let's start with you, Hans Bracker. Yeah, that's great. Thank, thanks, Ron. Yeah, very, very good question. Obviously, it's a very hot topic. Um, and over the last uh, probably four or five months, a lot of work is happening by, I think, everybody around the globe in, in understanding, okay, how are we going to respond to all this? How come to Kind of recover definitely in the uh, in, in the energy space, um, and what what we see a lot is that um, companies are struggling with investment. Well, there's, there's no doubt about it. Cash is kind of quite quite hard to get to at the moment, um, but I think what we see is that customers are focusing more on where they're investing and what they're investing in. So on the one hand, we're seeing projects being uh, scaled down quite dramatically, but if the moment you start thinking about how do you get people back to work and the automation around that space. So how can you start looking at um, uh, managing distancing of, or detecting PPE equipment or the whole kind of building management and work management? We see enormous interest in that space. That's kind of the first step. Um, but that's very closely followed by how do we now start optimizing where people do have to go to work, right? So I think back to the field service space, for example, how can we start reducing the number of people that are actually out on the plant, on the oil rig or on the roads? Um, how can we support them with the right internet and, and technologies? So indeed, IoT and Edge is, is one of them, but also about remote support. So where you normally would have two people flying out, can we support them remotely? Or even can we support our customers and partners directly through uh, augmented reality, through um, uh, through all, all the kind of channels? And it's not something that's new, it's always been around, but what we've seen definitely an uptake on is, is a bit of um, relaxing of compliance and regulations. So all the, uh, a few months ago, you wouldn't even dream of having a camera doing a temperature, body temperature scan. Suddenly it's being relaxed and it's happening, right? When you're thinking about AR, when, you scan, when you're hovering your phone over a piece of equipment, uh, you might capture a hand or a part of a body or another person in the background. That wouldn't be allowed a, a couple of months ago. Well, these days, I'm, okay, it's accepted because it helps the remote working and keep operations going. So with those kind of technologies, in terms of going back to work and optimizing the way people work, we see a big, big um, kind of increase in, in demand and projects we're running. Very good. Daniel? So I think maybe what I would like to focus on is how the current situation is kind of breaking paradigms um, and how our capital is being reprioritized. So I think what, what, what we're seeing at the moment is out of necessity um, a huge increase in the use of the technologies that Hans um, just mentioned, particularly collaboration tools, cloud-based services, uh, remote experts in the field. Um, 
some of those conversations have been difficult in the past, and, and since January, we've you know, in just one of our facilities, which is the Gorgon LNG plant in Barrow Island in uh, Australia, we've deployed 300 iPhones to the workers who, um, who, who help operate and keep that field going. And as a result of that, they've, um, they've seen huge improvements in areas where they didn't even realize their planning is better, they're, they're communicating with office-based people actually in the field, looking at real pieces of equipment, uh, the use of AR, technologies to, to kind of enhance how people are working and what they're doing has, um, has definitely been accelerated. So I think that that, that overall is, um, has been a good, um, a good outcome of some of this is, is that we've been forced into having to really utilize these tools in a way where they were there before, but we, we perhaps chose other, other ways to, to work. And so, um, yeah, I think for me, that's, that, that's the key one. We, we do have some challenges. I mean, LTE is a critical piece of making all this work, and we were on a um, you know a long journey in terms of making sure that we had that connectivity across all our plants and fields. That that has been impacted by um, our ability to get people there to do the construction and execution work. So in some areas uh, things things have been slowed, but it's really changed people's perception and, and um, drive to get these things done. Hans Klaassen, what, what's your perspective on this? I, I think uh, I, I partly agree with both Hans and, and Daniel when it comes to the operational side and, and the sort of philosophy thing. But, but I don't think COVID-19 will have such a huge impact on the actual automation of a plant or a, a facility. Uh, there is definitely pull in the market now for our argument, augmented uh, uh, solutions and remote insight. Um, just during the, the um, COVID-19 crisis here in, in Northern Europe, we've had several FATs where the client should have been present, but they have accepted that we use virtual tools and, and realities to actually get the thing still delivered and stuff. So yes, on those kind of levels, we see a huge change. But for the actual automation of a plant, I don't think the impact will be as good. Then I actually agree with the 9% that said no in, in your survey. <laughs> But but it but it's it, it's from again from an automation engineer's perspective and 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 I think if you, you mentioned uh, Daniel the mining and I think we've been part of that autonomous operation we've done other mines also in northern Sweden where we automated uh, these things and and from that perspective that there are industries that are ahead of the pure energy industry, such as oil and gas. A follow-on question actually coming from the audience. When you think about the, um, the challenge around um, having, having investment money to spend, um, we heard from Daniel talking about focusing the spend, uh, where to spend it. Um, what would you say uh, to people who are struggling with um, with perhaps uh, less room to spend money than in previous years, while at the same time, there is potentially the promise of a relatively small investment compared to the total spend profile in order to deliver meaningful cost savings or improvements in the safety, uh, the safe operations of the, uh, of the system. I, I, I think from, from my perspective, uh, the answer is digital because a lot of these digital solutions are actually a lot less expensive than traditional uh, automation systems. And we also see that this, these technologies that the digitalization brings, uh, brings new business models where the capex span might not be as high as it would have been for a complete new system. So I, I would recommend uh, such a client or, or those that have or are, or are strapped for cash that they do actually try some of these digital solutions and the new business models. It could be subscription-based or performance-based. I mean, uh, this is again where you come down to you no longer need to act as a, a, as a supplier and a, and a client, but rather a partnership where you go in it 
with both feet and, and you both get wet or you both find gold. Very good. Um, so to all of you, um, there's a, a related question from the audience, which if I can paraphrase is asking about um, whether these um, systems are sufficiently reliable and have enough uh, fail safe mechanisms uh, in order to support the these autonomous decision taking being being uh, good enough. Uh, and in particular, there's a sub question around whether there could be corruption of the data uh, in some way, which would then interfere with the quality of the decision making that comes from bad data. And especially if that data is deliberately corrupted by a third party, a malicious third party. Yeah, yeah and, and I think it's important to mention that these kind of things, and I think the, the mining project uh, that we're talking about up, up in the Nordics, I think is something we're doing together. So that that's that has been a journey, right? It's not something you implement and you go and run. That's something that's being built very slowly, initially with getting information, monitoring information, linking it then to the processes. And the process you go to the kind of automated vehicles and kind of it's been quite a long, several year journey. But as you're going through that journey, you have to, to, to kind of look at that risk on a step-by-step -step basis, right? And kind of build it out as you're kind of going along. Of course, with an, a target architecture in mind, but it's not something you, you do uh, just overnight. So when we think about, uh, we, we talk about quite a few different types of quite big automation projects to kind of small kind of uh, kind of augmented reality type uh, solutions. Right, so we've got quite a different perspective here. But uh, most of those are indeed are, are uh, full safe or can be made uh, kind of uh, full foolproof uh, and secure. Um, but it, it depends a lot on on the company's attitude towards cloud, for example, and yet. Yeah, I've definitely worked with the organizations who have kind of proven track record in, in security. So when you're going for small kind of digital solutions, uh, maybe with smaller companies, then yes, please be careful. Um, but if you're going for the, the more trusted brands, quite often they have uh, qu quite a good kind of security network in place to make that make that happen. Uh, and I think, Ron, I, I would like to add, I mean, this is a bit of a combination of the, of the two questions that you just asked. You, you've definitely got to have a pragmatic value-based approach that you're trying to balance near-term value with long-term scalability. And aspects of long-term scalability are things like your cloud strategy, APIs, security, your data standards, um, and, and what we call kind of platforms. But I think where, um, so what, where some of the misconception might come is um, I, I don't see this as, as necessarily pure automation as, as both the hands as we're, we're, we're talking about earlier. Often we're trying to augment or shift people away from doing the data to insights and, and um, or data to information, information to insights piece and focus much more on what are the insights and what are the decisions we're going to make. So to me, a lot of this technology is augmenting um, and empowering and enabling our operators to make better decisions. So a great example would be the application of data science, for example, in, in our plants and process for optimization. Um, last year, we delivered about $400 million in extra revenue as a result of data science applications that we were able to layer on to assist our operators in making better decisions. So a great example would be something like uh, our acid gas removal unit in our LNG plants sometimes foam, and it's a very complex problem, but the utilization of data science can predict when those type of foaming events might occur and help the operators make decisions that might um, prevent the foaming from closing the plant down. Um, so those, those types of things, most of the data is coming from the PCN, the uh, process control network, very, very difficult to, um, to corrupt any of that data. Uh, the data analytics platforms at the moment are kind of sandboxed, and but we do see a future of this being in the cloud with very sustainable uh, industrial solutions kind of layered on top. And I think that's why um, it's been mentioned quite a few times, we, we, we're shifting away from these vendor relationships to much more strategic partnerships with um, major technology providers because you need to be certain that their ethics and values are, are common with yours and that uh, the data and information that, that's being uh, transmitted is meeting the requirements that, that, that you both 
see in terms of data security and and other and data protection and other other issues. So I think that yeah, those partnerships are, are extremely important, and it's much better to be going to the likes of IBM or Microsoft with a vision of where you're trying to go to and work with them to get there than to come along and, and say, right, we need X or Y. So I think that that's how um, this digital transformation is, is, is changing relationships. I don't see, uh, yes, there are uh, challenges to make these things scalable and industrial, but I don't see them as, um, uh, as, as big challenges as say culture and people and, and, other, uh, and other issues we face in our industry. Okay. For, for, for my side, I would like to comment the question uh, more directly, and that data can be corrupted no matter where you are. But for the OT systems, there are cybersecurity standards that I recommend you to adhere to, IEC 62443, um, globally accepted, NIST in the US, uh, that will ensure that some of this data is maintained and that you can actually rely on it. So we do have things in an OT environment that secures these type of data streams. Very good. And, and, then, and then just to mention, if you, if you, or a food for thought, I mean, safety systems are a key to any plant uh, and whether that is to protect the people or the equipment or the environment uh, for whatever reasons. But if you move to remote control, you certainly can take away the parts of the safety system that protects people. So, so there are benefits to be had when you move into remote control in, type, in terms of what systems you actually need on a plant. Very good. Um, we have m many questions coming from the audience, but unfortunately we are drawing towards the end of our session. But clearly that, um, just to give you a flavor as, as the panelists of the type of questions coming in, questions about the use of AI, uh, questions about uh, digital twin, questions about um, the impact and skills that are required if we move more towards automation, what kind of skills are going to be important uh, for those people who are interacting with those systems. Well, unfortunately, um, we are uh, somewhat out of time. Um, thank you very much, all of you, for your contributions as panelists. Thank you also um, to the uh, participants. We would like just to finish off uh, with the audience with uh, one more poll. Um, it's another um, uh, word-based poll. Uh, if you could choose three words or three phrases to give you um, your takeaways, probably words that work best, um, to help us to understand what, uh, what you've been able to glean from our session today. And while those answers are coming in, given that I think most of the audience would like to get away more or less on time, uh, let me just summarize by saying that uh, we've had um, a very robust and uh, both technical and business discussion around um, the opportunity for remote working and automation. Clearly, um, there are examples of how this has been done, um, but there's still a lot of opportunity to be captured. It's a subject which just by listening to the, uh, uh, to the way in which people talk about it and the types of comment, um, there's a large amount of interest. People are recognizing, just looking at the word cloud, that this can't be done unilaterally, that there, there does need to be collaboration, there needs to be partnership, um, but the, clearly the, the opportunity is sufficiently large for it to be worth investing in that type of activity. Um, let me end then by thanking all of you, to our panelists, Daniel, Hans, and Hans, uh, to the Energy Institute for putting this on, uh, to IBM for sponsoring, and most importantly, uh, to the audience for taking the time in your busy schedules uh, to listen, to ask questions, and to participate in the polls. Thank you, and I wish you all the very best. <music>